Hello hires, so we now need to look at DNA organisation. So very well knowing exactly how DNA is structured, which hopefully you now have totally sorted, um, but you need to know how it's actually organised inside a cell because it's quite different in different types of cells. Right, so these are basically every single living thing on the planet. And we have here three different groups, uh, the bacteria, the archaea and the eukarya. Okay, so bacteria I know you've heard of, uh, archaea probably not, but I'm assuming you have heard this term. And what that means is the study of ancient things, so these are ancient forms of effectively bacteria. Um, you can see where they kind of live, here's methano, so these, these things live in methane based atmospheres. Um, so places where there's not a lot of oxygen. You've got halophiles, so these are things which like high salt. Thermal means high temperature. Uh, pyro is fire. So basically these things all live in places which are not normal. They don't, they don't fit into a normal range. And what we think is that these ones were the first kind of forms of life, the ones that were formed where you had pretty vicious places, um, which is what the Earth was like. A few billion years ago. Um, the eukarya, you'll notice that we are over here, oh here we go, animals, um, and these are very different in terms of the other two. So there are two specific names for this, the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes, that is what we're going to be talking about, I'll be talking about. So the prokaryotes are our oldest forms of life, so they were the archaea and the bacteria, and they're, they're in some ways the simplest, um, which is probably why they've been given this kind of name. Um, they are everywhere though, but the name itself, the pro means for before, and cario would be a true centre or a centre, so this is before the centre. Um, and by centre what we're really talking about there is nucleus. So they don't have a nucleus, so therefore they're before nuclei appeared. But they are everywhere. So you find them in hydrothermal sea vents, so like under extreme pressure, deep on the seabed where you've got um, cracks and you've got volcanic kind of activity, so you're getting heat coming through, they live there. You find them in hot springs, like in Yellowstone, they find them in places well over 100 degrees. Um, you get them in subglacial lakes when they've drilled down into places which there's been no water's been trapped for hundreds of years and they've still found prokaryotes in there. They find them in desiccated areas like the desert. Europa is a question, that's one of the moons on Jupiter. But we reckon if you're going to find life elsewhere, this is the most likely form. It's going to be a simple cell which is very well adapted for dealing with really nasty conditions. So the actual structure of a cell, it looks very much like you had for your kind of basic bacterial cell. Um, so it lo obviously looks a little bit fancier, but the basics are still the same. So you have the, the single circular chromosome, this bit here, um, and it's basically just kind of mushed up in, in the cytoplasm. It's not doing anything um, clear about how it's organised. Um, you have a kind of capsule that works around the outside of the, the cell, but generally you see it and it just looks like it's made, it's the same part as the cell wall. You don't need to know about this. This is not, this is extra. Um, and this bit is extra as well. You don't need to know the names, uh, but what you do need to know is that this exists. And you obviously know it, it would have a cell membrane. And I've not seen it come up in a problem solving, but I really could see that they could talk about transport across two layers here. Because in between the cell membrane and the cell wall, you have something that is a slightly different setup. Into, it's not outside outside, but it is outside the, the, main, the cell in terms of the cell membrane. So you could imagine there being slightly different concentrations of ions and things like that in there. So the cytoplasm, you sometimes see that as the cytosol inside textbooks and stuff, just don't get freaked out by it. Plasmid, that is really important. Um, I hope that you have this properly sorted in your head from genetic engineering from the Nat5, but you really do have to understand what the plasmids do. The plasmids are extra bits of functionality. It is like the app in your mobile phone. You know, the apps give you extra things you can do and think of the chromosome as being like your operating system. So the operating system is what gets the phone actually working and then you can add in the extra things it can do. And what's nice about this is that we can actually alter plasmids. So it's like writing a new app. Um, so really important. 
you've had the flagellum mentioned in that five inclusions um you don't need to worry about these really but just in case you see things that don't look normal inside a cell for there's extra bits in there um inclusions are just extra bits of um membrane which are packed with things that they need ribosomes you already know about and we have the pili and we're going to talk about this one in particular about how bacteria can pass on dna from one to another which is also how we ended up with superbugs so a bit depressing in that way but that's your basics so the essential thing is you should know about the cell wall you should know about the cell membrane oh that's a terrible thing around the outside you should know about the cytoplasm you should know about the plasmid you should know about the ribosomes this is going to come in and you should know about the chromosome okay so inside prokaryotes all we see is you've got a single circular chromosome loosely gathered up and we have plasmids that carry extra dna coding that's it that's your prokaryote in terms of dna organization the eukaryote is something a bit different so apart from your bacteria and your archaea everything else is made up of eukaryotic cells okay we are made up of these so this is a tree that shows you where we think things have started so right at the bottom we have our hypothetical common ancestor so this was the first cell that existed on the entirety of the planet and we have a branch in this one of these cells or one of these ancestral cells gained a mitochondria and a nucleus and this was the big split once you have a mitochondria and a nucleus you're going down the eukaryotic line well actually once you have the nucleus you're eukaryotic um, but they also all have mitochondria the, if you went the other way with no none of these you notice we're up to the bacteria that includes the archae and then there's been some other big splits in time here's your split when the chloroplast came in so this is going to the plants uh, we've got other splits in terms of like organs forming you know here we've got the vertebrae so this is the difference between the vertebrates and the invertebrates um, whether we have placental mammals and non-placental mammals so there's all sorts of kind of big 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 evolutionary splits in the kind of tree of life as you would look at it maybe so yeah the name as i've mentioned before means true center the u bit here is a uh, greek for true and cario is to do with center and what we mean by that is we have a nucleus now a nucleus is not just dna it's the dna all kind of scribbled round but most essentially it is the dna which is covered by or enclosed by a, nu a nuclear membrane and that membrane is just made up of normal plasma membrane which you should know from fluid mosaic model um and that's basically what we mean by eukaryotes but what we also mean for eukaryotes is that they'll have other membrane bound organelles so your mitochondria which look a bit like that and your chloroplasts which are a little bit more like that although to be absolutely clear about this because it's actually really important later on this has a double membrane and you notice this one is a double membrane and there's some very cool theories as to why that happened so and this is this is where we think it happened from so what we think is that that split the eukaryote cells becoming prokaryotes you know we're talking two billion years ago this is not recent and what's happened is that the nucleus has occurred because inside the old prokaryote you've got a membrane which has started to kind of fold in you can see it's kind of just moving in the way here and it's pushing the nucleus or the nuclear material all together and eventually you're ending up with it completely encapsulated inside a nuclear membrane or the nuclear envelope now there's a lot of structural reasons why this is actually a really good thing for the cell but it's a kind of trade-off so what we have is you have a particular area with a particular job and that means that you can do things much more efficiently this is the cell version of what we do with an organ and but there is a trade-off because you've got more complicated and if you've got more complicated it's going to make it harder for you to divide quickly so if you're talking about a prokaryote so like a bacterial cell they can do a split in about 20 minutes like a full cell division 20 minutes one of your cells 
even going flat out, it's like 24 hours. So it's it's harder for you to divide quickly. Um, and that means that in terms of evolutionary speed, things like that, prokaryotes have got an absolute rocket compared to us. So, but it does make the cells more efficient in certain ways. Um, the other trade-off is if something goes wrong with one of these little organelles inside a cell, because obviously an organism does, so to make it sound kind of smaller and cuter, we'll make it an organelle. Um, if something goes wrong with one of those, then you have no backup because it's not distributed through the cell. So if you imagine from our point of view, you know, our kidneys are doing all of our filtration. If your kidneys stop working, you have no backup. Nothing else can do that job. The organ that does that job is the organ that does that job. So yeah, trade off. OK, so in eukaryotes, the organization is a little bit different from the prokaryotes. So in eukaryotes, what we have is linear chromosomes. So basically we have a line of DNA. Um, you should know that we have inside each of our cells, we've got 46 um, specific long lines of DNA. But if you had that, if you can imagine, well, imagine 46 bits of thread. If you just put them down, they would end up in, you know, in a, in a kind of little ball. They would literally end up in a ball. You wouldn't be able to, they would be wrapped around each other. They would be twisted. They might actually pull each other apart. It's no good. So what you need to do is to organize it. And you need to organize it in a very, very particular way. And what they do is they use proteins called histones. So this would be a strand of DNA that they have wrapped around some proteins. These specific proteins are called, they've given different names, like H1, 2, 2A, 3A, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then once you've got a little kind of group of them, you then go along a little section from DNA and you do another group and you create these beads. And the phrase that the SQA uses for this is beads on the string. So it looks like a bead, little link, bead, little link. And then each of these beads can then be kind of stacked on top of one another. From what you know about DNA structure, you should know something very particular about this nucleotide and in particular this phosphate group, because I told you about it. Um, I said that this here had a negative charge, quite a strong negative charge. So from that, can you think what charge the histones must have if they are going to stick to the DNA? If this is negative, these must be positive. Excuse my shorthand, that's always what I use for negative and positive. So once you have your basic nucleosome, as it would be called, with your DNA wrapped around a set of histones, you then actually use each of those beads to make it up into an even more complicated one. So just to show you the pictures of that, this would be as progressing kind of up the way, making more of more of these. And eventually what you get is something that looks very, very, very neatly stacked. And this is what you see during replication. You actually see this very, very, very carefully stacked together set of condensed chromosomes. So overall, what we have is in prokaryotes, you get a circular chromosome, whereas in eukaryote, you've got linear chromosomes as well. Um, prokaryotes, they don't have any association with histones, so the chromosome is free in the cytoplasm, okay? Whereas in the eukaryotes, you need to associate with histones so that you can pack it. In the prokaryotes, let's say free in the cytoplasm, and in the eukaryotes, it's in the nucleus. And the prokaryotes have this special extra stuff where they have circular plasmids. And this is the real kind of sneaky one in eukaryotes. The mitochondria and the chloroplasts also have circular chromosomes which is why we think that possibly what happened was you had one big cell that swallowed a smaller cell and basically kept it to do the work of aerobic respiration in the case of this one and photosynthesis in the case of this one. And why we think that might have happened? Remember I said that we had double membranes? So we think in the mitochondria that this inner membrane would evolutionarily, looking really back, far back, that would be the original membrane um, from the original prokaryote and this one would be the bit of membrane that was used when it kind of swallowed it um, and the fact it's got circular chromosomes in there that really lends evidence to it if you want to have a look at it this is the is the theory um, it's 
pretty close to we know this is what happened level of theory um, endo meaning in symbiotic meaning living together so living together by being inside if that makes sense um, and it's it's fascinating stuff and we now know that there are certain diseases that can be passed down in the mitochondrial DNA uh, we know that um, we can track the DNA through the mitochondria back through um, various uh, methods um, but what that will give you is a family tree where we can trace every single human on the planet back to seven individuals who are referred to as the seven daughters of Eve um, so yeah interesting stuff go and have a look at it yeast is a special exception that you need to be aware of it is a eukaryote so it has uh, linear chromosomes packed inside a nucleus with histones but what is also in a yeast cell which is not normal for a eukaryote it has plasmids now what that means is that you potentially can genetically engineer a eukaryotic cell and that that's quite important because sometimes if you take say a gene from us put it into a prokaryote it just doesn't do what you want it to do because it doesn't have all of the kind of special things that happen um, to eukaryotic proteins when they are processed but if you do it in yeast it will work so I will let you pause this one if you want to pause it and see if you can figure out what's going on here and uh, this one up here is a eukaryote and all of your R class are your prokaryotes um, I just liked it um, that's us.